Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible yes, crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Did you notice it says, one receiveth the prize. Now, the explanation that I would offer is that Jesus Christ has one body, the church. And the one body, the one, receiveth the prize. Amen. These talks on crowns are not to be confused with promises to overcomers, even though they're all blended together, wonderful truths of God. But to me, this is our heritage. You just stay in. Because this dear man says, I don't want to be thrown out. <laughs> I don't want to become a castaway. I suppose you've seen castaways drive on our highways and they're the sore spots, cars that used to be first class. Came right from the assembly line, all painted and ready to go, and somebody went the wrong way. <coughs> and now they're wrecks. And there are some Christians, they make, they make utter fools of themselves by not thinking of the glory which is to come. And they become wrecks. Now, I don't want to become a wreck on the Christian highway. I want to make the grade and win the race along with all the rest of the brothers and sisters who shall win the race and we shall be one body in Christ. So that this is heritage we're talking about. And of course the only way to get the thing that goes with your heritage is to stay in. I was glad for the hymns that were chosen this morning. Our brother must have been looking over the scripture and he did. Well, they're right in accord because this is associated with the coming of the Lord and that has been prominent in the two hymns we sung. Now notice, please, we will repeat what we have said other days concerning these crowns. A crown is a recognition of some specific accomplishment or attainment. It is a great thing to be a Christian it's a very wonderful thing to keep it right to the end. For I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But he hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now get the rest of it. For the Spirit searcheth the deep things of God. The Spirit of God has been sent to dwell in you to compare you with truth. He knows what the truth is. God knows how much you've grown. And between the members of the Trinity, there's a consultation about you day by day. And the Spirit of God is moved because this is all a directed ministry. You've been brought into it. We are to be directed. But the Father directs the Son, the Son directs the Spirit, the Spirit directs you. Don't ask me where I found that, but I read my Bible. <laughs> and I think I've discovered something like that. And so the Spirit of God scrutinizes you where you are in your growth. And he searches the deep things of God and says, I wonder if she can take that. Because you're now grow growing. I tell you what my mother used to say to me. I say, Mother... I've got pain. She says, that's growing pains, my boy. So I decided to grow. <laughs> and Christians have a lot of growing pains. They think God's mad. He's not. The devil's mad because you're growing. 
God's glad that you can uh, take a new size of glory suits, and, but it does, uh, it does cause some pain to grow. See, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And scourging hurts, but it also promotes growth. So the Spirit of God searcheth the deep things, deeper than you've gone, and then looks at you and decides you can take it. So you get another pain, but you grow. So don't mind the pains, just thank God that they're all growing pains, and then just grow. Now notice what Paul says, that uh, they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, and the prize that is mentioned here is the incorruptible crown. And then he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. If anything is disappointing, it's to meet a fellow Christian who doesn't know where he's going. And he doesn't know what it's all about. He knows he has the historical record that he got saved. And he got the baptism. Other people would need to be told to recognize it. Because they kind of fade. But if one will read God's word, then he'll learn where he's going. He learned the way. And Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I know where I'm going. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Now, I had a fight as a boy. I was a boy that was kept at home a great deal. My brother and I were just 13 months apart, and we had a little bit of a backyard. Once my mother let us out, and I had the most atrocious language when I got back. I swore at my mother I never went out again <laughs> to play with the neighborhood children. I got out sometimes with uh, good supervision, but uh, I didn't know that was bad language. <laughs> you see? But of course my mother did, and she checked on me. But uh, I, I had to learn that I had to keep my body under. See? That I was under divine supervision. And that God is determined that you're going to walk the line. And if you turn to the right hand or to the left, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. Don't go over there. That's wrong. Stay here. It's the highway of holiness. And we have an ever enlarging <coughs> grasp of what God expects. So just read your Bible, it'll get in. Don't sit down and say, I must memorize the chapter today. See, uh, not that I don't believe in memorizing the Bible, but I found out that it can memorize me. It can just get into me until it, it reads me. And when it reads me, I learn to understand it. But now this, as Paul said, has to do with staying in the race. I keep under my body. Now why does he say body? Because that's the subject. The incorruptible crown has to do with your body. You're going to get an incorruptible body someday. So please stay in so that you don't lose what God has planned in this wonderful heritage. I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I've been in the ministry since 1911. I've mingled with my brethren. I know them. And uh, to my dismay, I could count one, two, three at least of my brethren in the ministry who landed on the rocks because they didn't keep their body under. And it's a very real danger. So what we need to do is to listen to God's word. I keep my body under. You live in a dying body. Now that's what it says in, in Romans uh, chapter 8 uh, verse, uh, verse 10. See, the body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life because of righteousness. So that we have a body 
that has a carryover from the fall. And uh, while our spirit was dead and is now alive through the new birth, and our mind is being quickened with the truth that is seeping into it because you read God's word and pray, your body is still a dying body. And it gives you more trouble than the rest of your being. Now maybe you don't know that, but I've lived quite some years, and I've run into some pretty bad snags. Right temptation that I could have fallen like that, and I had no desire. I discovered that there was a law working in me that's called the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now if I went into detail, you'd almost be shocked that a fellow who's a Christian but would have to say those things, but I didn't fall. I made it. I could say one, two, three, four times I made it. I could have plunged into deep sin. I didn't want to. Now, would you like an explanation of that? This is a little side now. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You see, isn't that wonderful? I'd like some of that. Well, you've got it when you were born of God. And when somebody comes to you and you're well prayed up and walking in, in communion and says, listen, on the QT, we don't need to let anybody know I've got a plan for a big outing and we'll do the town up red tonight. How about it? Oh, I can't. Can't? Why, well, you've got two feet. Can't you go along with me? No, I can't. Something with me won't let me. Do you know what that is? The seed of God. And the seed of God is so clean and pure and dynamic, it makes you hate the things you once loved and love the things you once hated. That's what the new creation will do. So that there's no excuse for anybody who falls out by the way. The blame is altogether theirs. They just failed to abide. If we abide, there's power enough to carry over every rough place when you're tempted by the devil. Paul says, I don't want to become a castaway. Now we've been talking about the crowns and you know, thus far we've talked about the crown of righteousness and the crown of life. Today it is the incorruptible crown. And I'm just going to follow it through like this. First of all, we'll call it the incorruptible crown and give you one or two scriptures. And then, what is it? When shall it take place? That is the crowning. And uh, how shall it occur and why shall it occur? God has a reason. You know, God has a plan that he'll share with you as far as the knowledge of it is concerned if you'll let him. God will show you his great disappointment over Adam's failure and his delight because of the last Adam's success. He made it. And then they offer to you, if you choose the last Adam, I'll bring you through and show the world what I've done. And he's going to do that. There's going to be a manifestation of the sons of God someday. And creation will be amazed at those, those, do you know what they called us? Well, the offscouring of the earth. I say we are members of the S-E-S-A. The sect, no, S-E, no, sect. Oh yeah, that's right. The sect everywhere spoken against. <laughs> That's what I belong to. The S-E-S-A. You see? Now then, uh, that's what you'll find. Accept Jesus Christ and they drop you at least 50% in their estimation. Keep on believing and find that they, 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 they rule you off. <laughs> that fella, he's got too much religion. Well, they haven't got any. That's their pity. See, we've got something that does the job. 
And God's going to show to the world someday what this off-scarring group that were despised and rejected as our Lord was have come through and what he's been able to accomplish for we're going to come back our Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints the word says so God whispered that in Enoch's heart and that's a long time ago somewhere around the year 900 not, nine, not, not 900 AD but uh, uh, let's see now 4,000 4,000 oh dear anyway you know what I mean it isn't 4,000 but 3,000 BC something like that you see just the seventh from Adam you can begin to figure now and where that comes in but I did it one time and it was somewhere around the year 900 that God said to Enoch listen I want to tell you something the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints so we not preach that. That's what you preach to now. He told it to you. The incorruptible crown. It says in the <coughs> chapter we read, verse 25, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible, we strive for the incorruptible crown. That doesn't mean you earn it. It means that you have to, have to put forth everything that's in you to see that you get it. To see that you get it. And as we trace the thoughts, you'll see why. Now look please in Philippians chapter 3, verses 11 and 14. <coughs> Paul says, his effort is put forth, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now that's the first resurrection. Paul says, I put forth every effort, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now bring these two verses together. We strive for the incorruptible crown. Like Paul, we run a race, striving to win participation in the first resurrection. Now I do not believe something I used to believe until I found it different in God's word. I do not believe that some saints are going to miss the first resurrection. I believe that all saints shall be in the first resurrection, but please remain a saint. That's just the difference, you see. Remain a saint. Because if you overcome, you overcome every day. I don't know if you heard the story of the man who was told by the doctor that he'd got a certain condition and his only course of safety was to eat an apple a day for the rest of his life. And he was so disturbed, he says to his wife, where will I get all those apples? He was probably 30, if he lived until he was 70, 40 years to go. 365 days in the year, and every fourth year, an extra day. <coughs> Multiply that by 40. Where will I get all those apples? His wife says, get one every day. Now, wasn't that simple? How will I overcome? Overcome today. God didn't ask you to, leave, to live next Saturday. You're not there yet. Lord, yes. Just live today. Pray today. Believe today. Overcome today. That's all. When you get to the end of the day, thank God he kept you. Do that every day. You don't need a barrel of apples or 50 barrels, or 100 barrels, or 1,000 barrels. All you need is just constancy, serving God acceptably day by day. That's the way you run the race. That's the way you become a participant in the first resurrection. So Paul says, I run, I'm pressing on. You have to. If you don't attend to it, it'll attend to you, and the first thing you know, you become cold-hearted and lose out. We've got to really work at this thing. So you see, the incorruptible crown requires that I stay true to God. 
Now then, what is it? What is this that we call the teaching uh, associated with receiving the incorruptible crown? It is the full redemption of our body. I was speaking in Toronto for the last two weeks, last Sunday morning, because somebody said to me, do you ever preach on the coming of the Lord? Well, I thought that'd be nice to do it, so I prepared a talk on the coming of the Lord for the last Sunday morning. And at the close, one brother says to me, I've learned something that I never thought of before. He learned the meaning of the incorruptible body. It never dawned upon him that that was a dead body which had corrupted, see, and therefore existed no more. That the one who used to live in that body was coming back to get a brand new body by an act of creation. And he never thought of that before. Well, that's what it is. If you die before Jesus comes, see, the body is dead or will die because of sin. Not your sin. Oh no, that was Adam's sin. You just simply participate until you're born again, but you didn't get a new body. You got a new spirit, and you're renewed in the spirit of your mind as you read God's word, but you simply haven't got a new body. Say, if I've got my new body, I'm ashamed of it. With all the pains and the weaknesses and the... <coughs> the, 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 uh, the new body won't do that. It'll never cough, it'll never sneeze, it'll never say, oh, never. It's a body that'll be Praise fresh God. from the handiwork of God and it'll live forever. No death. Amen. No death. Now that's our heritage. That'll be the incorruptible crown. So you see, what is this that we call the incorruptible crown? It is the full redemption of our body. Now, if you'd like to turn, I'm going to quote from Romans 8, verse 23. Romans 8, verse 23, I'm quoting just sufficiently so you get the thought. We which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now Paul knew that he hadn't got it. And sometimes he felt the weaknesses of it. But he had a secret. He carried his medicine with him. He carried it on the inside. I don't know if you ever read that, but you turn, if you will, for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now Paul is talking about his body. And he says in verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Didn't say he was dying. He bore that truth around in his body. The dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. Did you know that's what Job had? It looked as though he'd sure die. But he would not give up. He, he had the, the remedy right in his body. I know that my Redeemer lived. Hallelujah. So you keep in your body the truth of the Lord for the body. And just as long as you're granted leave to stay here and at least claim 70 years. <clears throat> Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. At least claim 70 years. I did that and I got it. So now you know about where I am. You see? <laughs> I claimed it. I saw that it was in the Word. The years of a man are three score years and ten. I said, Lord God, that's what I want. So I got it. I believe in taking this just as it says. And if at times you found that uh, your body was delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, then I took a little nibble on truth. The Lord for the body. The dying of the Lord Jesus, a truth which I hold in my body. Why? For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Now your soul is not mortal. Your spirit is not mortal. Your body is. 
When you die, all they put in the grave is the body, in spite of all the other teaching that the soul goes there too. My soul isn't going there. Sometimes people, in talking about the things of God, and they're not saved, they say, oh, well, you know, no matter what church you go to, we're all going to the same place. I said, that's it, but I'm not going there. I'm going to another place. <laughs> I'm not going the general course. Oh, no, I'm going to another place. I know where it is. It's a place prepared by the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. My soul is not going to weep and pine in the darkness of a grave. My soul can't die. My spirit cannot die. My mortal body must die if Jesus tarries. So this is the quickening of the mortal body, a little earnest of what's going to, what it's going to be like when you really get the new body. <laughs> Hallelujah. So it is the full redemption of the body. We which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Question number two. When shall this take place? When am I going to have this incorruptible crown or the incorruptible body? When shall it take place? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 21 and 23. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 23. For since by man came death, by man, came also the resurrection of the day. Christ the first fruits. Afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now if you've got that date, then you know when. I just don't have the date. Amen. But I have the description of what might be and so I look forward. I was in uh, Massachusetts uh, a little over a year ago in the home of a very nice couple and their Lovely son, he was so godly that almost he didn't seem to be natural, but he was a nice boy though. <laughs> he used to take his Bible to public school, and then the, the principal grumbled at it. Well, <clears throat> I suppose it was all right. But uh, uh, what do you think this dear lady said to me one morning as my wife and I sat at breakfast? She says, Brother Swift, do you know what the Lord Jesus said to me when he baptized me with the Holy Ghost? I said, No. He said, you will be here when I come. I said, sister, he didn't say that at all. And she looked so disappointed. I said, that means, let's see, you might be 38 or 40, that he must come at least within 40 years, and he has no promise in his word that you can predate. I said, you just thought that. It seemed cruel, but I thought I'd give her a jolt. Maybe as she grows, she'd get her eyes open. They don't get truth all at once, you know, but I gave her the jolt. Now, I did, do you know why I did that? Years ago, back there in 1911 and 12, we had a man in the church in Newark. His name was Nash. He was one of those kind that always talked and sometimes didn't think. And uh, he, he used to love to tell us this. He says, you know, one time when the power was falling, he says, somebody tapped my shoulder, and, I, and there wasn't anybody there. And the voice said to me, you will be here when I come. And I had his funeral. <laughs> I had his funeral. Found him dead in bed one morning. He wasn't young. Now, did I lose my faith? No, I canceled the man's aspirations. God doesn't promise that you'll be here when he comes. He just says, our Lord cometh. See? So when will this take place? The receiving the incorruptible body at the coming of the Lord. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. How shall it occur? Maybe a peculiar subheading, but you'll see what I mean. In this same chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 52 through 54, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, for this corruptible, 
must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. There's a tremendous lot in those two verses. This corruptible means, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you died before he came back and your body has corrupted. This mortal means you are alive and remain when Jesus comes back. And you are changed instantly from mortal to immortal. Now that's all, it's just as simple as ABC. So, since Paul is talking about the incorruptible crown, and he did pass on, then he knows that what he said is now his as a promise, and he's in heaven, but he's going to hold on to that promise, he can't lose it now anyway, but he died not having received the promise. God didn't cancel it, the date hadn't come. And so he died with a promise, I shall be corrupt, my body shall decay like all flesh, but someday I'm going to come back and I'm going to get an incorruptible body. So when will it take place or how shall it occur? It shall occur in a moment. You cannot get yourself fixed up three minutes ahead of time for the coming of the Lord. You just get fixed and keep fixed day by day. Because you have no private wire. Jesus doesn't say, listen, listen, the middle of next week, Thursday at 11 a.m., I'm coming. When you tell me that, I may call you a liar. <clears throat> because I know he didn't say that to you. He doesn't say those things. He says, in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. But how shall it occur? There'll be no time whatsoever to get ready. You either stay ready or else. And you stay ready day by day because you walk in the light. I like this scripture. It is 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. You just have one day to live. And even then you can't guarantee you get all the hours in that day because there's no promise, you see? Except, of course, you claim you're 70 years, but uh, you can figure that out, you see? But listen, beloved, when Jesus comes, it will be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I take that to be winking your eye. How long does that take? I saw you do yours. Didn't take long, did it? See, I was looking at somebody. See? When you, that's it. And that's just how suddenly the coming of Jesus Christ will be consummated. So you see, I can't figure ahead. No. I just figure now, today, today, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Just before I got saved, I was working in a biscuit factory. That was my trade that I learned in Canada and uh, making soda crackers. And uh, there came from the city of Toronto a man named Harry Gates. He became the new foreman of our shop. He happened to be a Christian. Most of us weren't. And uh, the, uh, just at that time, the Methodist church about two blocks from the factory had a, an evangelist named Gail, an elderly man. I never did see him, but I saw his pictures. And yet I got saved in that church. During those meetings, the last meeting, at the last altar call, and I never did hear Mr. Gale preach. But I tell you what happened. There was a boy, boy working next to me. He handled the dough in that machine in a great chunk, and it came out about that thick. He threw it up to me, and I fed it through that machine until it became just that thin, and then it was stamped into crackers, and the man on the end put it in the oven, and then the girls boxed it, and then the market handled it, you see. And that's what went on day by day. And this fellow had never been to Sunday school, wasn't any kind of a churchgoer, just a tough, little tough. 
And uh, he got saved. This man, Harry Gates, persuaded Roy Loomis to go to that Methodist church. He got saved. And every morning I got the report of the, pre of the preacher's message the night before. <laughs> oh, he didn't know what he was doing. I felt like giggling. And then I felt like weeping. He just couldn't talk straight. He hadn't been to Sunday school. I was a Sunday school boy. From as far back as I can remember, until I was 18 years of age, I was in Sunday school. I knew a lot about the Bible. But I didn't have any fruit in my life. And he said, Do you know what he said last night? Ba, 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 ba. And I got worse and worse. I was so sad. And I began to pray. And I prayed until the very last night of that meeting, I stepped in at the time the altar call was being given, and here this boy, Roy Loomis, tapped me on the shoulder. Will you go forward? I will. That's why I came. I knew what I was going to do. And I left that church with salvation. I've still got it. That was 1906. Hallelujah. You see? But the thing was this. This Mr. Harry Gates was a, a funny kind of a fellow. I mean, uh, quaint. He'd greet you in the morning. Good morning. Did you find him? Find who? Well, you know, the Bible says, they that seek me early shall find me. And that's the way I remember Harry Gates. Did you find him? Did you find him? Listen, you've got to find him every morning. Please don't live on the tear of our style of living in these days. We're nearly all moving by jet propulsion. Now, I refuse. I refuse. I've got to, I've got to meet God first. That's why I get up early. I get up at quarter of six. I set my alarm because I want to meet him. You say, why don't you come down to breakfast? Well, I was telling Brother Palmer I'm being treated like a, like a king. They wait on me. <laughs> now, don't wish for it. When they get old, maybe you can get in there. <laughs> but uh, I, I must get up early to meet God. Beloved, that is absolutely essential. They that seek me early shall find me. That'll keep you in trim. You'll get your crown then. Wow. So, <clears throat> how shall it occur in a moment? Now, why shall it occur? To me, this is the, it is the most important thing as a climax because it shows what God has in his mind. God is dreadfully disappointed that Adam didn't make good. And as I said the other day, I believe, that in the almost the very last verse of that chapter in Luke where you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ through Mary, it traces right back to Adam, the son of God. Not a capital S, but Adam, the son of God. God wanted a human family. And he made one man who had the power of procreation. He gave him a companion. It was God's intent that this earth should be peopled by sons of God. And that one man disobeyed and died and God lost his son. God lost his son because he died. God arranged, of course, that he could get in on the, the redemption. So he, he clothed his nakedness and showed him how to approach through blood. And Adam taught his children, and they taught their children, and they taught their children until you have the, the tabernacle under Moses, and then through the prophets, and finally God's land came. But he was just simply building up his case, you see. But God had a big case against the devil. The devil killed God's son. Maybe a quaint way to put it, but that's, he was to blame. Do you know who that son was? He was the ruler of this sphere down here. Now that will be my last message. I won't tell you any more now. <laughs> See? But he was crowned with glory and honor. You can chew that in the meantime. But listen, beloved. God says, but I'm not going to be defeated. I'm going to realize my original purpose in man whom I created. So now look at this. Please turn to Romans 8. 
and we read verses 19 through 21. Now this is why it shall occur, why we are going to come forth in all this wonderful glory with either an incorruptible body if you've died or an immortal body if you didn't die and the body is the same kind of a body, it just depends which group you were in. You see, and it says here, for the earnest expectation of the creature. And in the margin, I was so glad that Mr. Schofield has it, creation. Because it means creation. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now man is God's creation. He's not talking about the lower animals. He's talking about man becoming sons of God. Therefore we must concentrate on that thought. God is going to demonstrate how he has succeeded in his original purpose through Jesus Christ the Son. Mm -hmm. And if you can get this point, before you're saved, you try to be good, and it's all in vain. Your effort is subject to vanity. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, said the preacher of the Old Testament. What did he mean? He was a man that was... Uh, rather uniquely situated. He had plenty of money. He had prestige. He had anything he wanted and he spent too much on women, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, uh, he did tell us something. And it was this. He said, I've watched it all and vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And that's all you'll ever get as an unsaved person. I tried to be good God knows you tried, but you didn't get there, did you? Now, why didn't you get there? Because God has subjected creation in hope. You'll never get it in the old creation. You get it through the new creation. And as soon as you step out on the side of the Lord and become a member of the new creation, you're marked. And most of your former friends turn you down. Don't worry about that. There's all kinds of nice friends you're going to get. Mm -hmm. See? Don't cater to them. Oh, no. You've moved up higher. See? But that'll be your experience. If they have persecuted you, they'll persecute me. If, 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 they, if they have persecuted you, no, but if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they received me, they'll receive you. That's what we find. Some people will listen to us and let us lead them to the Lord. But most people will turn us down. Why do they do that? Because they are children of the devil like you were. Don't think that that's demon possessed. It isn't calling them names. It is a spiritual state. And Jesus labeled it that way. The very religious people of his day, he said, ye are of your father the devil. They didn't choose it. Somehow something happened, and you know what it was, the fall. So it changed a spiritual relationship. And the only way to change back is to receive Jesus Christ and be created again, children of God. And God has made the creature subject to vanity. And if people are sincere and you begin to talk about the Lord and the wonders of this life and what God has done for you, someone might say, I always thought there was something like that. Well, there is. There's a life that can be obtained. It'll take you through triumphant. But you have to humble yourself under the hand of God and say, I am a sinner, I am lost. And until you say that, you can't get saved because you're stuck on your effort. And you'll make it, you'll make it. I'm not as bad as I used to be and lots of people worse than I am. 
<laughs> you just think so. There's nobody worse than you are, and they're as bad as you are. To be lost, you're lost. You're lost, you're lost, you're lost. You're dead, spiritually speaking. And the only way to ever get into a new state is to be born Amen. again. Whether you're like Nicodemus or like the thief on the tree. Same thing. Because the fearful don't get in. The unbelieving don't get in. The whoremonger doesn't get in. The idolater and all, all down the line, the liars. And they're all the same. They're all dead in trespasses and sins. A lot of people don't like to hear that because... They've been so used to complimenting themselves that it's quite a shock. Uh, and, and, and they don't like to hear that. They think you're narrow. But notice, please, God's testimony of complete triumph through Christ. Now, this is why this, this thing shall occur, that we shall receive these wonderful bodies, that God's testimony of complete triumph through Christ may be demonstrated to the world when the Lord cometh with his saints. Amen. Do you realize according to the wording of scripture that the revelation of Jesus Christ will be the worst shock that the people of this world will ever have? Mm -hmm. They'll have gone through the reign of Antichrist. Everything will be absolutely rotten as far as morals is concerned. They'll be absolutely godless because they listened to that other ruler, the Antichrist. And suddenly, Jesus Christ comes in all his glory, and the saints with him, and this is what the scripture says, Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. What a shock. They thought the Antichrist was God. Now they meet God in his glorified Son. It will be a shock. It won't be a shout of rejoicing, it will be a shock. For they know they've got to answer now for all of their blasphemy. That will be followed by the judgment of the nations which you read in Matthew 25. But God has that, may I use this term, God has that trump card to play. And we get it in other words concerning Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is that blessed and only Praise potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords. What's he doing in the meantime? Waiting. Is he disturbed? He can't be disturbed. He's sitting on the throne. He knows what's included. He knows he triumphed. He said it on the cross. It's finished. His reception back in heaven and the return of the original glory to him is a proof that he made good and he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And God's going to show what they missed. Do you know what that's going to bring about? The worldwide revival you're praying for now. Why don't we get the, the worldwide revival now? You're, you're not, you haven't got your dates right. <laughs> you get local revivals and they can spread over quite a territory, but this is a big <coughs> world. <clears throat> when Jesus comes back, the millennium aims for a worldwide revival. Now that's that chorus. And the glory of the Lord. See? The glory of the Lord shall come. The knowledge of the Lord shall fill the earth when, as the glory of the Lord shall come. By the way, may I sing, sing my, 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 uh, that, that chorus a different way? You, you get your... your your second line, too short. Third line, listen. It shall flow like a river. It shall fall like the rain. It shall rise as the dawn in glory o'er the land. That's the way I learned it. I like that better. <laughs> because in the first place you don't get your, your time right in your music. You put about three words in five beats. That doesn't belong there. See? It shall flow like a river. It shall fall like the rain. It shall rise as the dawn in glory o'er the land. And the knowledge of the Lord shall fill all the earth. 
as the Spirit of the Lord shall fall. Do you know what it's going to be? A worldwide revival. A worldwide revival. And the result you can read in Revelation chapter 21, where mention is made of the saved of the nations, and they are not the church. The church has her home in the New Jerusalem. The Lord God and the Lamb have their headquarters in the New Jerusalem and is going to come down to dwell among men. And the saved of the nations shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. But I mean it. Amen. <laughs> I mean it. Amen. I get in first Lord, because we bear the reproach at the present time. Now this thought in closing... With all of this wonderful promise, we must close with a word of warning, and it is found in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, and uh, there are a few verses preceding verse 28, which we'll not read, but they are evidences of the last days. And then it says in verse 28, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So that will be the first resurrection, the change of the living, the translation. That's when your redemption draweth nigh. And so it says in verses 34 through 36, a real word of warning, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, mm -hmm. and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The great snare of the present time is preoccupation. People don't read God's word. They don't pray enough. They go to church and if they can sit through it without falling asleep, they're quite fortunate. But the world is on a tear. And they're, they're screwing down in, in, in the, in the uh, area of labor and they're trying to get as much out of the shorter time that the unions are determined you're going to work for them until people are so dead, tired, they don't know what to do. Well, why don't you go to church on Sundays? Well, a fellow's got to have a little break. So they quit work on Friday night, get in a speedy car, sometimes they get to their destination, sometimes they don't. <laughs> just depends who they hit on the way, you see. But they'll tear along and get back, dead tired, can't even pray Monday morning. And then another week of tear. Now that's the picture, see. And this will deplete one's spiritual life until you could run right out. Now I'm going to say something. It says in... Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter, I'll find it, with this we'll close, but I, I want to give you a thought here. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And the margin says, run out as leaking vessels. Now please, don't look upon that as a sin. It's just what you are. You're a leaking vessel. I'll show you what I mean. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Some years ago, I visited a, a new town in Yunnan. My wife was home, and I went to a place called Lingan. 
And in that town I bought the nicest little babies. Only cost me about a nickel this money. About that size. Just earthenware. With a bit of a glaze covering to it. But it had the prettiest pattern. There were flowers in that clay. They were made of another coloured clay. The little vase was brown. The flowers were greyish white. Somebody had cleverly taken this clay and worked it into the main body of the vessel before it was hard, just was all pliable. Then they gave it a once-over. I mean, some kind of a lacquer, I don't know what you have. And I took it home to my wife. I still have it at home, but I, I rather prize it. She was pleased, so she put it on a nice little shelf and put some water in and put some flowers in it. And when we came back, the flowers were wilted and there was no water in the vessel. It leaked. So do you. You're a clay vessel. I don't care how full you are, you can't hold it. You ooze among the people you contact. And they say, I, knew I, I like that person. They seem to have a nice sweet spirit about them. Well, you're leaking. <laughs> you're leaking. But listen, please learn that you're dry when you're dry and go back and get some more. That's all. See? We can hold it. We simply leak. We're an earthen vessel that just is earthen. Now, it's true. That's what it says. We are of the earth earthy. Doesn't it say that? We're an earthen vessel, we can't hold it. God didn't intend we should hold it. God intended that it should so fill you that a person might even touch your clothes like they did Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm simple enough to believe that. I was in a church up in Canada. And, uh, no, not Canada, Cleveland, quite some years ago. And uh, I just, this was at my first meeting. I said, you know, friends... We have a custom in the Pentecostal church which you can't find in scripture. I said, we anoint handkerchiefs. Now, it doesn't say they anointed them. It says that handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from the body of the Apostle Paul. I said, may I make a suggestion? If you want a handkerchief to be used so that it might bring relief to somebody, ask your pastor to put it in his pocket. And after he's carried it around for a few days, then he'll give it to you. That'll do the work. I believe that. What do you think? I had six in my pocket the next day. <laughs> I carried them all that week. I believe that when I preach God's word, that if I have met God in the beginning, my body is touched by the power of God. You see, that's in God's word. And, and why should we quibble over such things? You don't advertise it, but that's it. And I've seen it happen again and again and again. And so, at the end of the week, I gave them back their handkerchiefs. I went a year later to the same church, said nothing about handkerchiefs, and I had another pocket full the next day, showing they must have worked. And uh, some years ago in, in, in Newark, there was a lady who was a member of the church, and she was a good Christian, but she had a husband who drank. She came to me one time, she said, Brother Swift, will you pray over this handkerchief? I want my husband to stop drinking. I said, sure. I said, you hold it and I'll touch it. And I prayed. When I saw her again, I said, how about that handkerchief? She says he never drank again. She said he didn't get saved. Not right then, but he got saved before he died. But he never drank again. Do you know why? God touched that handkerchief. See? When you do those things, you can count upon God working with you. She put it under his pillow, and the fellow lost his appetite for drink. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I'll turn it back to you. Let us sing the chorus with that line. Is Brother Swift taught us as the dawn in glory or the land.
have to kind of put the brakes on. Let's make it our prayer, shall we? Our aspiration. Let's sing it from our hearts as we close our eyes and sing it. It's a Praise.